Hey everybody, welcome back to the Brand Muse interview series. I'm Philip Van Dusen, and today I have with me Daniel Scott. And Daniel is an amazing designer and trainer. He's a certified Adobe trainer. And uh, Daniel originally kind of we connected when he reached out to me and said he'd used some of the examples in my 2018 trend video for examples in his most recent advanced Photoshop course. And that was totally intriguing to me, of course. And so we connected and uh, I've since gotten to know Daniel and he's obviously an incredibly talented guy. He's a certified Adobe trainer. As I said, he speaks annually at the Adobe Max conference, which is no, no small feat. Um, he's trained thousands and thousands of people, and uh, he's got an amazing uh, website called uh, Bring Your Own Laptop, where he shares and sells uh, Adobe training uh, programs. So with that, I will welcome Daniel. Thanks for having me, Philip. Well, so why don't we start off with just a little bit about, you know, why don't you describe a little bit about how you got to where you are right now? You have a website where you sell training. And um, what was your journey to that, um, you know, in terms of your career? Did you start off training or you start off as a designer? Or what was your kind of path there? Yeah, so I started, like, I went to university to do kind of fine arts and, you know, wasn't really focusing on design until I kind of stumbled into a, a lab in a room that was doing design work. And I was like, what is this stuff? Like, it wasn't really introduced to me at high school. It's it's something I kind of stumbled in. I was like, they were using those, you don't remember those jelly bean kind of IMAX, the things with the big glass kind of blue plastic. And I was like, why why are not, why am I not in here doing this uh, this kind of stuff? So I got transferred and started, yeah, my, my degree ended up uh, majoring in design. And so my kind of career path has been a little bit like a little bit of freelance, a little bit of training. So when I was studying, uh, I was able, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a software nerd, right? Like I love the software and the nerdiness of it all. So um, I ended up teaching like the night classes at university. So I was still studying and I'd stay on at night and teach people software labs. So I kind of did that and then went off and freelanced and started an agency with a friend and that was a bad idea. And then went back to training at university for some other university. And it's, it's been a little bit of that for a long time, you know, for the first 10 years, it was like freelance for a chunk, then go back to training because an opportunity. So it was, it was a nice thing. I, I, I felt like I, I was able to go back into teaching and have real capable skills because mm. I was actually working in studios and internal departments and stuff. So I had a, I felt like there was a nice kind of stepping thing along. And it's only recently that I've gone, say, full time into training because I, I think I like it the most and it allows me to do a bit of both. I get to create like like you said, I get to uh, like look at cool design trends like I did on your video, getting kind of exercise files ready to make sure that my when people are doing my courses, it looks good and is up to date. And so I think, yeah, I get to do a bit of both now, but I definitely have ended up on the side of training is what I love and what I do. So you have a YouTube channel where you put up some free content, which That's right. um, is great. And uh, I suggest anyone go check out Bring Your Own Laptop, which is his YouTube handle. Um, and But you also have your own website where you sell training courses, and That's which right. are very reasonable, I might add. And uh, when did you make the jump from you know teaching in person in community college or in you know or or colleges um, and night classes to hosting your stuff online? How did you make that transition? Yeah, the first step was like doing it for other people. Then I started my own certified training center. Like a, it was my first successful entrepreneurial business, and it's a proper classroom sit down training center in New Zealand. We are number one. In New Zealand. Oh, so you is, still have a physical location? Still, yeah. So we do that. Still, oh, it's fully okay. managed, and people come and they do it, and like that's that's kind of how I started. So I ended up doing the training, running the business, but my plan was always to step. It was never I was never meant to be the Dan show. It was always meant to be, you know, like I love it now. It's fully managed. It's run by Margaret in New Zealand, and it's just it takes me an hour a week to look after, and you know. And it, it does double service. I get to kind of create my videos and that kind of builds the courses in New Zealand. So I started with that, like sit down classroom stuff. And it was awesome. But I just, I, felt, I hit the ceiling real quick in terms mm. of just what I could do. Like being number one in New Zealand <laughs> is not the hardest feat. And like, once you're there, 
there's nowhere to go and if it's not like it wasn't like it was it was doing okay so i decided to go the online route like i did that for about six years and it did really well but everyone keeps saying go online online's the way and i kind of eventually decided all right i'm gonna go full noise into online and that's how i ended up going from kind of university to doing proper classroom stuff to now doing videos video training and you have uh, how many videos do you have on online on your site there's about 30 courses and they they range from about some of the shorter ones are 15 videos but like the advanced photoshop is more than 100 like that's a big class and loads of videos so and how, how many hours is that uh so the long ones are about seven to ten depending on like some of the web design ones need a lot of talking to explain things whereas photoshop's a little easy it's like let's make this awesome thing and we just yeah. get started you know whereas some yeah. of them need a little bit more like the ux courses there's a little bit of education involved so they they end up kind of going out long, longer but i like the longer format that's that's my it's my thing i like doing like i want people to open it up and come out the other side like there is nothing else i need to know that's awesome and uh have you had any kind of mentors or people that have inspired you to take your journey that you're on yeah i guess like my personality is uh like what i like to do is I'm, i like to verbalize everything to anybody that will listen right so if I've got an idea, I will tell 20 people before I act. It's just it's just something that I do, right? And it's amazing. Like I and I kind of act on like maybe a more of a like an aggregated response from people. But there is a few people. There's there's quite a few people who get a couple of extra votes in that kind of, you know that uh, you know that I respect. Um, and in terms of specific people, like I guess I don't want to name people specifically, but there's probably about three or four people that I can kind of off the top of my head go, those are the people where they say something, I, you know, I listen a little bit more. And what, what I kind of identified kind of from those people is that what makes them different is that they're not the yes people. You know, I've got lots of friends. I'm like, I can convince anybody my idea, except for a very few, few mentors and advisors. And they'll go, no, that's, that's back it up. Explain that to me again, you know, rather than the whole, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great idea. I like to pass it past these people. Cause I'm a little bit nervous. Cause I know like, they're going to, like, if I tell them, I need to be a bit more ready than I have to telling my neighbor or uh, we have a couple of my colleagues. So there's a few people that are just, they're not yes people. They are, uh, yeah, people that will call me on my uh, unthought out or poorly planned ideas. Right. So I talk, uh, I talk a lot on my channel about people kind of owning their own destiny. And you've been, a, I think you were a great example of that and someone who has kind of built his brand not on borrowed land and within your own kind of evergreen content. And um, I encourage designers, even if they're working in an agency or a company, to start to kind of uh, build their own personal identity and personal brand that's independent of those things because eventually they may have to rely on that. Um, and you've done an amazing job of that. You have your YouTube channel, you have your you know, very successful website and training courses, you have your retail, obviously, establishment, which I didn't know about yet. What other platforms do you, are you putting yourself on? And how do you drive traffic to those sites? How do you do your marketing? Um, in terms of like, I guess, developing your own kind of personal stuff outside. Like there was a couple of questions in there. I felt like there was one about developing your own personal brand. And like, for me, uh, like not putting all my eggs in one basket has always been a thing. Like I've got a couple of businesses. The The latest business I've got is, is called Instructor HQ and it just helps other people create their courses like I do. I'm just trying to help them do that. And like, it's amazing like part of that kind of training is all about like trying to make sure that you've got lots of options open like like for me as an instructor i have youtube brings in stuff it pays like it pays a couple of grand a year it's not gonna retire on it but it's a it's a channel that i own and um, but youtube kind of owned the platform so you know i have a strong instagram uh, account and in terms of my like getting courses out where i find the most value is it's all about like distribution right so you can have something but if people can't find it or can't access it like how much how worth you know, how, how much is that worth so like there's 
like places for me like there's I've got a place like Udemy where I sell my courses. They they provide probably the highest revenue, but I also have it on Skillshare and I tend that garden really well as well because it's not as much, but it's kind of, you know, splitting my eggs, uh, you know, not having them all in one basket. And then I have my own site, which makes the least of the three. Mm. Okay. But it, you know, because I, I feel like if I double down and just put all my effort into one of them, I would do more overall. But I'm trying to like spread it all around so that, I can't be, you know, I can't, if you to me decide you're out of here, buddy, or they go bankrupt or something happens, I'm, I'm kind of protected. You know, that's, that's, that's always my thing is I'm trying to, trying not to, I'm trying to help other instructors not see just let's, let's not just jam it all into one place. Let's try and build these other things. And that's slow. That's the painful part of it is building these other channels and these other networks and distribution is, it's the painful part, but it's the, Stuff for me, like it's it's totally coming through now. Like it's three years ago, I was tending this stuff, and now, like painfully, it's blooming now. And it's like, man, and everyone's, you know, if you look at it now, you're like, of course, that's of course, is that is what you'd do. And I find like if you're a, I don't know, it's one of the big changes I feel for graphic designers or any sort of designer, is that you can't rely on that working at an agency for 30 years. You're probably not going to want to, you know. There's just such a ceiling in terms of income or in terms of work, you know, that you want to do that you need to, I feel like, I feel like kind of side hustles and all these extra things, like you said, building a YouTube channel, if that works for you, building portfolios and various platforms that aren't, you know, even if you're working internally, you can, you can still build out those other things. And I find like side hustles, like making a course, like it's such a, I feel like it's such a, even if it's not going to go full time like me, for somebody who's in the creative industry and wants to do something else like on the side, it's uh, even if it doesn't pay a crazy amount, it's this kind of extra thing on the side that could turn into something amazing. But even if it doesn't, even if make a, you made a really terrible course and it earns, like my terrible courses earn <laughs> maybe a hundred dollars a month. And that's not worth my, you know, every evening and weekends for a month, but it adds up over a year. And these courses, I try and keep it kind of, if, as evergreen as I can, then it becomes two years, then it's three years. And there's, I kind of look at it and like how, if you were working just in one place, you're working in an agency, what would you have to do to get an extra two grand pay rise? You could probably, it could probably happen. But if you made a course every, you made one every three or four months, not hardcore, just something extra. It doesn't even have to be a course. It's just something, it could be selling stuff on Etsy or just these extra things. If you start adding those up, there's no way you can get, like you can't get promoted beyond a certain sort of level in an agency. Even if you are Mr. Creative Director, you know, there's a, there's a ceiling to it. All these extra little things add up and they open opportunities. And like, I feel like that's, that's the big kind of missing link or the next kind of step for people that are, especially creative agency, like in the creative world, it's such a, not an easy thing to do, but it's a, it's a, you know, making a tutorial and helping others is, is definitely something happens in studios and in kind of, you know, happens anyway. You might be that person in the agency that's like, yeah, I know how to do this really well. I'd love to, you know, you enjoy the personality type I think is there for creatives to, to be able to excel at this kind of, waving at the screen and helping people kind of move along. That's a long answer to your question. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I'm a big believer in the evergreen content thing. I always like to say that I'm kind of the poster child of the success of content marketing just because of, you know, the amount of videos that I've put on my channel and how they are evergreen content. Cause a lot of the things I talk about are not time stamped, And so I've built up this large library of, knowledge that continues to work for me and drive business to my agency while I'm sleeping. And so I think it's all about finding those, like you said, small side hustles where you can start to build up a bit of content, a bit of a library of valuable things that can work for you in one way or another while you sleep, whether that's a blog or whether that's a, a course or whether that's, you know, a portfolio or, you know, whether you design fonts or whether you, you know, do stock photography or whatever that is. Illustration, we were talking before we actually hit record about Society6, right? And there's Society6 where, you know, illustrators or artists can license their work for, you know, Society6 to put on any product if anyone wants to buy it. So there's so many different ways that creatives can 
develop that, I think, library of evergreen stuff. And so that's really encouraging to hear you talk about that. Um, and how do you, I, you alluded to, you know, being in so many different places. And at the beginning when you were building that up, that it was a lot. But now that you've kind of got into the groove, it's manageable. How do you, um, how do you, you know, keep yourself from going on to the next shiny thing? You know, like when Periscope came up, everyone's like, Periscope. And then like six months later, everyone's like, ah, Periscope, you know. So how do you keep yourself focused? One of the things I always tell people is like, don't try to be everywhere. And I think you've been very successful at being, you know, kind of you've just find a lane. That's it. Like I started off with my hair on fire running around like I got to be on like you watch a YouTube post. And you're like, you got to be on Twitter and you got to be on Instagram. You got to be on this, that and the other. And you're like. So I created all these accounts, like zombie accounts. Like I don't attend to them. They just kind of wander the internet with nothing going on. And then like, I think probably the beginning, that's still probably what needs to happen until you find your home, especially if you're new to that side of things. And then like, I hated Instagram. I was like, man, Instagram sucks. Now I love Instagram because of the, uh, it, it, visually it's perfect for my kind of industry, but the types of people, the types of feedback, Whereas I put the same amount of effort at the beginning into something like Reddit or man, people are horrible on Reddit. Like, <laughs> so even if it was good, I just, I don't have the love for it. So I've either outsourced the stuff I don't love or like, it's, I think you just, there's a little bit of shotgun approach at the beginning and then like deciding, okay, this, these things are showing promise. I'm going to put, I'm going to cut all the other ones back. They're still sitting there. They're still zombieing around the internet, but uh, these, these two things this year are going to be my thing. That's what I've really like I'm real specific about that. Like I start the year, okay, I come in, I'm like, this year is like, this current year is Instagram and YouTube because YouTube already works and I'm trying other things. But Instagram, I had nothing at the beginning of the year, just mm -hmm. a little niggle of like people kind of doing stuff. I'm like, this year, I'm not going to do Twitter. I'm going to stick stuff on it because it's there and it's easy to do, but I'm not going to do what I've done with Instagram and try to work out how to get the best from it for me personally. I find I can't do too many things at once. So like, like everybody, but also, I want to make sure that, like, I've I've put a big cross through Facebook when I started. It's like Facebook does not work, but I put zero effort into it, so I, I marked it off without putting any sort of like proper effort into it. So Facebook's now back on the list, mm -hmm. but it's in the I will do it later. Like I will get to you, and I find that works for me, my personality. That it's not that I'm not doing it; it's that it's waiting its turn in the queue mm -hmm. after Instagram. Like I feel like Instagram, I love it. Is it working? It depends on how like personal brand it's working but in terms of conversions in terms of business no it's not paying anything so it'll probably continue but i'll probably move on to facebook and see if i can make that you know see if i can you know turn it into a commercial success because that's what i need as well youtube nailed commercial success love it brings in lots of people people buy courses keeps me and my family you know keeps the bills paid and everything so instagram is probably going to get to the end of the year and just be uh, probably auto managed. I'll get somebody to help me do it. Whereas mm. Facebook will be the next one. I'm like, okay, Facebook are into videos. Videos work for me. I am going to go all out. So I just try and specifically pick something and do it until it can't be done. <laughs> yeah. I had <laughs> the same on. similar experience when I was starting YouTube with Twitter. I was scheduling, you know, two posts through Hootsuite, you know, a day to promote my videos. And then I started doing some Google Analytics tracking and realized that. People were liking and following and all that sort of stuff, but they weren't, I wasn't getting traffic to the videos. People weren't clicking on the link to go to the video. So I was putting all this work into writing original tweets and all this stuff. And after I just, you know, after I found that I was just like, nope, done, walked away from Twitter. It was like a bunch that's, of marketing people talking to each other. That's, you know? yeah, but, but it works for some people. You hear, you hear a podcast, but someone, she's like, I'm killing it with paid Facebook ads. I'm like, oh man, I should go and do that. And yeah, you, you get a bit angsty about, oh, I should, shouldn't I be doing, you know, that it's really hard yeah, to kind of. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So you are in a unique position to, uh, to give advice to creative professionals and the fact that you are very hooked into what is, you know, achievable with the Adobe suite of products, which basically covers everything in the creative fields. Yeah. Um, and also knowing what people need to know to succeed in the industry. So what do you have, you know, any advice 
to people to what to kind of focus on or what to stay up on in order to bulletproof their creative careers? Probably the like the easiest, like very obvious trend at the moment. If you're looking for a job now, they'll say, we want you to do everything. Like you have to be a branding specialist and a videographer and, but there'll always be UI UX. Even if the agency or person hiring has no idea what it is, they'll just add it in there because it, <laughs> they just want that. They're like, just, they'll put it in there. Like yeah. it's a, the, the nice thing about that particular side of thing, not say you don't want to build apps or, you know, or design apps or design websites, or that's kind of traditionally the UX UI world. It's more products online, but that, that methodology behind UX, I think is what will bulletproof somebody that's staying in, say, staying in a more traditional, say print base, or, you know, it's hard to stay really niche like that anymore but say you're getting into the digital ad space or a little bit of extra stuff around that that whole testing that methodology that comes around ux i think is what what will like that's what people are why they're dumping it into job applications because it's something that it's 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 quantifiable it's really hard to say it, it's a little you know it's a lot harder. i worked in branding for a long time and it's and it's really hard to quantify how well it did if the client's happy that was that was basically most of it for us you know like their clients liked it uh, yeah, our client liked it their clients liked it job done but it was hard to measure did it bring in more revenue did it whereas ux and digital products like it doesn't even matter if you're not building apps or anything else the methodology behind it is such a valuable thing where you can go to colleagues or employees and say i did this thing and it's and it's and it's doing this you know and this is the result so it doesn't have to be positive or negative but you can prove so that next time when you do it, you're doing it with a lot more uh, understanding. And and the people that you pass it on to, if you're working in a really kind of creative role, they're, they're able to take those to boring meetings with, uh, you know, accountants and, and, and directors and say, we did these things, you know, this was our hypothesis, this is what we tried to do, and these are the results. And I feel like uh, that's such a important thing at the moment, that's why people are just dumping this UX into it. Like, you know, uh, they, they want to see reporting. They want to know why you did it and what happened at the end. And I guess with any sort of digital onlineness to it, it's really easy to do that as long as you've got some skills. And a lot of it is designers can, well, any sort of creative can do it because they have the, the, they just have the wrong language. They have the, like, they know what they need to say, but they're not using, they're not using the words like, agile or uh you know a user experience or touch points or page furniture or it's just a it's just a vocabulary that comes along with doing more ui ux work but it can be applied so well across things and it's like even if you're getting hired for you know uh I don't know, a photography job i just see ux being jumped in there and like that's all my students are like hey they've added this to it what do they mean i'm like they're just they're just slamming that in there to mm -hmm. try and get the best person they can and it's a useful kind of field to jump into and and kind of get involved is yeah and i think that, would, that those terms are so broad i mean user experience and and a user interface are so broad i mean user interface can mean everything from you know a design a design element a button to you know the whole look and feel of the entire website you know user experience can be the customer journey you know, and that's something I talk about a lot about is, you know, people have to stop talking about themselves and start thinking about what the problem is that the customer is trying to solve when they come to their website or when they come to their app and design for that. You have to figure out what the problem is, identify with it, offer a solution and tell them where to go and what to do. And so much of it is, you know, understanding that customer journey and then architecting your solution around solving that. And that's a perspective that a lot of creative people don't generally take. I mean, I think that that's kind of where the break happens between marketing focused people and design focused people. And the more creatives can start to embrace that marketing sensibility or the customer journey, customer centric point of view around their work is where that real unlock is for their business and for how they and like you said, how they talk about what they do. Because yeah. that is the biggest struggle is how do you how do you describe the ROI and what we do? Because yeah. that's what makes charging for what we do palatable. And it also makes it much more attractive to the numbers types. Right. So yep. I think that, you know, the, the quantifiability of ROI that you can find in 
you know, clicks and visits and all that sort of stuff in UX UI is probably super helpful. So that makes yeah. a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I totally agree. Like I was like, I, my first kind of like the first five, 10 years of my career was like, got brief, did not question brief, did brief, <laughs> finished, you know, like I just, that's what I did. Didn't, didn't question it. Like client wants what the client wants. But like now what allows me to charge like five times what I used to charge as a consultant is that I, I will get brief question the hell out of the brief and then we end up with doing something completely different because yeah like you said the customer journey or the the persona is like you know, not what they wanted and you can do a lot of that testing before you end up putting you know uh, uh picking swatches you know it's a it's there's so much more of that pushback that and it gives people like like say people that hire me or say I had a, um, a manager, it gives them confidence in me and gives them confidence to back what I've done. If there's a bit of, uh, you know, if, if they feel like you can be trusted and you, you, you own what's going on there, you're not just like, here you go, you ask for it, you know, and they, they pass it up the tree and go, here it is. That's what you guys kind of asked for. Like when there's a, a nice, uh, you know, when, when everybody along that step has had a good talk about it and figured out what needs to be done before you even get started in the in the kind of more traditional doing it phase of the design work yeah i think that that you know what you're talking about is base, basically something i just talked about in the video which is being a detective i mean when you come to the brief you have to be a detective because a lot of times the client is asking for something which is the thing that's not actually going to solve their problem so you have to dig in to find out what the problem is and then architect the solution and a lot of times that's not aligned they're like i need a whole new website and you, once you ask all the questions you realize <laughs> yeah. that they just haven't defined a customer journey and don't have the copy that leads them to click to the one button that they want them to click you that's know it. i get so many like uh we need a nap like that's the first interaction with the client you're like <laughs> Uh, tell me what you need. To, tell me, tell me what needs to happen first. You know, <laughs> like we an app probably will be it, but let's figure that out first. Right. You know, we need an app. Yeah. <laughs> so this has been great, and so I always end up with a question about um, a personal mantra or a personal manifesto. So is there a personal mantra or manifesto that you try to, you know, run your business, live your life by? <sighs> yeah, like it's more of a. It's like I use there's this one thing that I use, right? It's a bit corny, but it's a it's my it's more like a visualization that I use when I'm stressed out. Like mantras, I find you only need them when you're real stressed out or <laughs> things are going badly, right? When life's going good, you don't need a mantra. But I find when it's just just too hectic and not enough sleep, I find like I love the uh, the idea of kind of waves on the beach. This is my corniness, like. There are good waves, there are bad waves, there are angry waves, there are jealous waves, there are stressed out waves, there are lovely waves. There's no, like, you can spend your time trying to capture the good waves and try and stop the bad waves, but that's like that's that's what I find myself doing when I'm all stressed out. I'm trying to, like, block everything out and try and capture it all. But when I kind of visualize that, I'm like, this, like, whatever this bad wave is, the next wave is coming whether I like it or not and this one will go and this next mm. one will come and the next and that kind of more that kind of zen of like life is ebbs and flows and there's going to be good waves and bad waves and there's no point trying to hold on to the good ones and stop the bad ones that's my it's my visualization in my head I like that that is great because it's it is it's so true it's always such a journey roller coaster ride you know and things come back around um so how can people find you Daniel uh, easiest way is easiest way DM me. I am on Twitter. I am Dan Loves Adobe. Uh, Instagram. I am Bring Your Own Laptop. Or check out the websites, and you'll find me, Daniel Walter Scott. I'm on all sorts of things. You'll find me on your platform. You'll find one of my zombie accounts. I check the DMs. <laughs> <laughs> so what is your uh, what's your website address? I'll have it on the screen, but yeah, it's B Y O L. So bring your own laptop, B-Y-O-L dot M-E slash Philip, and you'll find me and all my lovely courses. If you want to do the Instructor HQ thing, it's InstructorHQ.com, and yeah, you'll find me there, contact forms. It's all just me. Awesome. Well, Danny, thank you so much for sharing your jewels of wisdom, and uh, <laughs> I, I really, really appreciate what you're doing for the creative community. You're, you're putting an amazing amount of knowledge out there and keeping us all up to date and uh, sharpen tools in the, in the shed. So um, thanks, Philip. Thanks again, and um, hope you come back sometime. We'll do it. See you, Bye. buddy.